Okay, today we are talking about text analytics, which is the big area of work that I do. It's what I think is cool and exciting, why I'm here. So I'm going to share a little bit of that love with you guys. So why do we care? I mean, obviously I care, but why should you care? Only 2% of data that's out there is structured. So it's in a format like a CSV, so you can import it, or it's in a database somewhere, or it's neatly organized on a web page, or anything like that. There's tons of other data out there that is just completely nonsensical streams of who knows what. There's some crazy proprietary thing that's never been analyzed, never been formatted, never been looked at in a lot of detail, or it's looked at within a very narrow context, and then no one cares about it. Between those two is text data. The written word has been around for a little while, uh, just 10,000 years, or 10,000 or so years. Um, as a result, around 20% of all data that's out there is in the form of unstructured text. So somebody wrote a post-it note and stuck it on the fridge. Somebody has a memo. Somebody took the meeting minutes of what happened. Being able to make that 20% of data look more like the 2% that's well-structured means we can throw it at algorithms, means we can learn things from it that we couldn't as long as it's sitting there and something that humans can understand but computers can't. And one quick thing before I go further, digitizing text isn't text analytics. So being able to re read handwriting or being able to turn uh, audible words into uh, machine representations so speech recognition, that's not really text analytics. It's a step before it. So what are we trying to do when we run text analytics? There's three main goals that we're going to be working towards. Information retrieval, information extraction, and knowledge discovery. So information retrieval is searching for a relevant document, a relevant piece of information. So I know that I want articles about what's currently going on in Syria. How do I find articles that are about Syria? Well, part of the answer there is going to be having a computer create a textual repre or a numeric representation of web pages, of news articles of all of that, and then information retrieval is doing some sort of math, some sort of prediction as to how related a document is to what you're asking it for. Information extraction is simply pulling out structured data that's hidden inside your text. So uh, let's see, you guys have actually done a few examples of this kind. Does anyone want to venture a guess as to what you might have done that is information extraction? Yes, regex is definitely a tool we use for it. Uh, there was a sample I gave when I first presented regex. I said, look for something within a sentence. Does anyone know what it was? Or anyone remember? That was a while back. I asked for company names. How did you define a company name? Oh, it's a bunch of words with capital letters, and then it has like co or limited or something afterwards. That right there, it's pulling out structured information. Yes? Does text um, web crawlers at all? Web crawlers do a lot of things, but text analytics is absolutely one of them. Um, technically, the crawler will just get the documents off of the page. And then to do anything useful with them, you often have text analytics. Um, and web crawlers specifically are actually a great example of information extraction because uh, web pages are usually written in a language called HTML. It's got a whole bunch of tags on it. So it'll have some angle brackets with letters and some properties that have equal signs and quotes around them. Being able to find, I want to know where every link is on this web page so that I'll know what pages to crawl next. You can do that by looking for a pattern, 
Well, show me every link here. A link looks like this. It's got an angle bracket, the letter A, a space, the word href equals, quote, something, an end quote, and then a close angle bracket. So I know that all the links are going to look like that. So I want to pull that structured information out of a web page. So that's another example. Um, and pulling dates out of something is another really easy one in terms of they tend to be some numbers separated with hyphens or slashes, and you could kind of figure out what the patterns are. So you've done a lot of the information extraction stuff, so you've done some text analytics already. The last area, and the big area that I do most of my work in, is knowledge discovery. <coughs> knowledge discovery is where you try and learn something new about the text, but not explicitly stated in the text. So, more depth, we've got information retrieval. It's looking stuff up. How do you do it? You type in some words, or you type in some phrases. Then it'll go and say, which documents are most like these phrases? Alternatively, you can have documents marked up. You can say, well, this document is 60% about football, 20% about Colin Kaepernick? He's a football guy? OK. Colin Kaepernick and is 8% about whatever team he plays on. You can get that distribution. And then when looking it up, you'll say, well, the question I'm asking is about 80% about football, or is 30% about football. Let's look for things that are also 30% about football. And it'll try and match it up that way by having sort of topic distribution. Uh, this also has the cool advantage of letting you say, here's a big old document. I wrote this article. Tell me other articles like it. Tell me things that talk about the same thing. I'm a customer, and I really love this content. Show me more content like this. So you can do topic-based uh, er, information retrieval. And natural language queries are a big area that's exploding now since things like Siri and OK Google have come about, where instead of typing in keywords or phrases, you'll say, hey, Siri, tell me what the capital of uh, Djibouti is. And Siri will come back and say Gaboroni or Gaboron. You asked it a question in a way that a human would understand. You didn't say parse sentence. You didn't say look up Wikipedia, find page for Djibouti, pull up capital. You just asked a question, and somehow text analytics transformed it into they're asking a factual question. This is a factual question that is indexed in a database on Wikipedia, based on Wikipedia. We can then find the page for. Djibouti on Wikipedia, and they go through and it completes all of those steps by transforming your natural question, your natural language query, into getting the information you want. Information extraction, it's just pulling out structured data that got mixed inside your text somehow. So you've got dates in it. Uh, one of Kai's uh, prior students, Jingjing, Jing, uh, got her big papers on pulling out citation networks by saying, well, academic papers have citations in them. We are going to try and find out a network of what papers cite what other papers, make links, and do all sorts of analysis on that. But a core early step in that is saying, well, what are the citations? It's things that have a last name, a comma, and a year. Or they'll have a journal name and a page number, or something like that. There's a wide array of different patterns there, but they are very well defined according to a neatly structured system of rules. So that's a great kind of thing to pull out with information extraction. Uh, it also is stuff like on our second exam. I had you guys pull out which of these are ales. You were looking for the word ale. You were extracting some property from rows of data. This is another thing you guys have already done, and it wasn't too terrifying. Finally, knowledge discovery. This is where you look for stuff that's not explicitly stated in the text, 
or if it is, is hard to reach. So I think the biggest example is probably document summarization. Uh, and that is saying, I've got a big, long document here. What are the highlights? What's the important part? It also includes organizing data, finding connections between documents, and finding things that maybe the author didn't know they were saying, which we'll talk about when we get to sentiment analysis. Uh, you guys have not done too much direct knowledge discovery in here, but conceptually, it's not too far off from what you're doing. You guys know how to make models. You know how to predict things based on models. You know how to aggregate data. Theoretically, if I gave you a tool in Alteryx that took in some documents and spit out their topic probabilities, you would be able to make a workflow out of it and then put it in data robot and go and look for what can we draw out of this. So it's just the algorithm step that you're missing. You know conceptually how to do this. Some of it. Parts of it no one knows how to do. But are we good so far? Do these goals and objectives seem reasonable? Is there something else you can think of that we might do with text? Cool. Then let's move on. So what are some of the tools that we used in text analytics? Natural language processing is where a lot of it came from. And natural language processing has a few different pieces. They involve things like text segmentation, where you break a document into parts. So I've got a book I want to break into chapters. That would be chapter segmentation. I've got chapters I want to turn into pages, page segmentation. I need to find paragraphs in a document, paragraph segmentation. I need to find sentences within a paragraph, sentence segmentation. I'm reading something like Chinese, where there aren't spaces between characters, word segmentation. So it's just breaking things up into the correct length parts based on rules of language. You need to do this because you need to be able to have your features trained in a useful way at a certain scope. A lot of this stuff is very easy to come up with good first order approximation rules. So you could say, how do I split sentences? Whenever I see a period, a question mark, an exclamation point, it's a new sentence. Well, what about names? What about certain abbreviations that have a period at the end? What happens if this one has an ellipsis that has three periods in a row? So there are weird wonky rules that go in here. And there are some where it's very difficult to do, like uh, working with Mandarin. But generally speaking, this is what segmentation is. Break it into smaller chunks so that it can be analyzed appropriately. Once you have broken it into whatever it is you want to look at, often words, you'll run part of speech tagging. This will tell you this word is a noun, this word is a verb, this word is an adjective. Something that you guys probably learned in like somewhere between third and fifth grade. Turns out computers not as great at it. But they're much better than they were 20 years ago. Once you have the part of speech tagged, then it starts doing really fancy stuff. That's when it starts parsing the data using either parse trees or dependency parsing. A parse tree gets a more detailed version of your same part of speech tag. So instead of just saying, this is a noun, it will say, this is a proper noun that is, I'm sorry, this is a proper noun that is plural and is part of this prepositional phrase. It is the object of, or it is the direct object of a verb, or of this verb. And it comes out with a fancy chart. Or that's usually how humans look at it. So that's a parse tree. Dependency parsing is the step beyond even that. Dependency parsing, instead of just saying, well, this is a prepositional phrase, and it's part of this noun phrase, which is part of this subject clause, will say, here are the relationships on what modifies what, so that you can trace it back to find out what's going on. 
they're interesting to look at, difficult programmatically, but neural networks have been extremely effective at making them much, much better than they were five years ago. And that lets you start doing some very interesting things once you have this dependency structure, because you can start analyzing and saying, well, they're frequently modifying a noun with something that I think has a negative sentiment. So they'll say those mean old corporations, that unhappy company, that cruel dictator. But being able to note there's a relationship here, they only do it when it's modifying the direct object. They don't use it on the subject. Why would you do that? All sorts of crazy reasons. But it turns out people can be manipulated by very subtle quirks in grammar. Being able to find out things like that is an interesting new option. Um, Jordan Boyd Graber, someone who uh, taught briefly in the computer science school, actually worked on developing a tool that removed bias from text based on a similar thing. It would find a word charge or a sentiment within trees and then replace them with more neutral ones so that it could try and say, well, let's try and write an objective article about this. Maybe that can help fight po political polarization. Um, he was still on the groundwork level of it, but that was what one of his big dissertation papers was. So these dependency parses do have some very interesting applications. Um, the last big natural language processing task is word sense disambiguation. This is where you have a word that could mean two different things. I have a base and a bass. They're both spelled the same way. Just looking at them, I'm not going to be able to tell. But somebody went on stage and played a bass is probably not right. Being able to tell these apart is tricky because we do it based on context. And context can't be picked up without some sort of parse tree and without some other information. And those are kind of like the core bottom level building blocks of what makes up text analytics. Once we go up a level, we can start to look at things like sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is where you look for meaning that is implicit within text that is not explicitly stated. And you do it by looking at what is the charge of this word? Is it positive or negative? And despite the name of sentiment analysis, it can actually be anything that has uh, two different ends. Or you can even do multi-label classifications. But it's been used on things like doubt and authority and wealth and political affiliation. So how likely is the author of a piece that uses this word to be conservative? Someone wrote a review on my website, or a review on my product. How likely is it that they actually purchased my product? Um, another interesting one that uh, Jordan Boyd Graber used was related to, it was just a fun little side project of his. There's a board game called Diplomacy. It's kind of like Risk, but there's no random chance. So instead it's lots of alliances and that sort of thing. He got his hands on a corpus of about 10,000 games that were in a chat program. Or there was a chat program that went along with it. And he went to try and figure out, is someone going to betray someone? Because eventually you will have to betray every alliance you make. No alliance is going to be permanent or you can't win. So what are some of the changes that happens? Well, future orientation versus present orientation is one of them. How much are you talking about the future versus how much are you talking about now? Once you have decided to betray someone, you talk more about now and less about the future. So that is a sentiment label of how future-oriented some text is. Um, so it can be almost anything, so long as there's different ends of it, and so long as words will be more associated with one end than the other. Um, going to politics or environment, whatever. Global climate change versus global warming. Obamacare versus the Affordable Care Act. There is different sentiment in them. When people use the terms, they tend to have some little extra bit of information that they are conveying. The example I have up here, anyone here watch Archer? Okay. 
well, classic scene, they believe that they have killed a uh, working woman. And earlier in the episode, Archer had explained she is a call girl, not a hooker. Hookers are all sorts of negative traits. But she's a professional. She's fancy. She's wearing pearls and whatnot. Once they think that she's dead, no, no, Cyril, now she's just a hooker. Because once you've killed them, what our perceived intention of their reputability is has changed. They have changed their opinion of her, even though the words are nominally synonyms. They refer to the same person. But they have very different entailments, what you think about them. So, can be anything. Uh, I talked a little bit about latent semantic analysis and dimension reduction in our recommend, recommender systems class. Well, here's how latent semantic analysis actually works. You start by pre-processing your text. So you do things like remove punctuation marks and break it and segment it into paragraphs. You do things like make it all lowercase. Maybe you remove some stop words. So a, the, and of that sort of thing. They're just going to be all over the place because they don't, so they don't add anything. Then you make the term document matrix. How many times does each word appear in each document? You dimension reduce it. So now you've got a smaller representation. You can project new content into it. And then you can calculate similarity between documents or you can perform certain other vector operations. I think one of the coolest examples that I've seen recently that made it into like mainstream news was the website 538.com. Uh, Nathan Silver's uh, data journalism website, which was recently, well, no, Disney just sold it to ABC, I think, or somebody. But it's data journalism. It's all about what, what can we learn about the news based on doing data analytics. Well, they went and did latent semantic analysis on users of subreddits in order to look at what r slash the Donald is. r slash the Donald is a, let's just call it pro-Trump. And then they're, so they were trying to find out what is r slash the Donald really like? What's it about? What are the people who use it like? So once they made vectors, I'm sorry, just take a step back here. Their term document matrix in this case, the terms that they used were what subreddits you're in. The documents they used are your users. Is a user on a subreddit? If so, your count is one. You are in that subreddit once. If you are not in that subreddit, if you haven't joined it or followed it or whatever the term they use is, then it's zero. So they went and ran this across thousands of subreddits. They dimension reduce it, they run this, and now they can start doing math on them because they can get a vector representation, a simplified look of, well, based on the kinds of people that are there, what can we learn about it? What similarities do these have? So r slash the Donald minus r slash politics. So a pro-Trump, uh, subreddit minus politics. What would this be if you exclude all of the stuff about politics? Well, the thing that it's most similar to then is r slash fat people hate, which is posting pictures of fat people and then trying to get them to kill themselves. Um, you insult them, you make fun of them, you say gross things about them, you post their home address and phone number so you can do terrible things to them. Uh, the internet is terrible, like just utter terrible. It has since been shut down, but that's what our fat people hate. So what are the people on this pro Donald Trump site most like when you ignore their political affiliations? Trying to get fat people to kill themselves. Uh, what are some other things we've got? Yes. Yes. 
So it's, it's membership data. It is, if you're on a Reddit, you get a one, or if you're on a subreddit, you get a one. If you're not, you get a zero. So it's looking for, if you like Donald Trump, what else do you like? Or if you like, um, well, there aren't any inoffensive, or if you like r slash politics, what else do you like? Um, so it's looking at lots of users who like the Donald also like fat people hate. Yes, they. Yeah, they yes they aggregate at the subreddit level um, once they dimension reduce it. Um, some of these other ones are so the numbers right here are cosine similarities that have been uh, normalized based on a few weird things and then sorted. Their justification for some of the math choices they made here is a little sketchy to me, but. Generally speaking, it's needed to aid in interpretability. They did some rotations and transformations that are a little weird. But so we have our fact, we have the red pill, which is a men's rights activist thing that believes women are manipulating, controlling the world. We have r slash Mr. Trump, which was the pro Donald Trump thing before he was involved in politics. So it was people who liked his business acumen and the apprentice and that sort of thing. Coontown is uh, also has been shut down, but it is an explicitly white supremacist subreddit. Uh, and 4chan just reposts stuff from 4chan. It's mostly bot automated, and then people can comment it there. Yes. Um, they have actually made all of their source data available and the code to run this analysis. So um, I'll go and look up the link and post it uh, in the Slack. But you can check and verify all of this if you're interested to get some sense of how confident you are. Um, no one is. It's been shut down. Um, but they did all sorts of other analysis here, like what do local... Trump affiliate branches do. So what is Minnesotans for Trump minus Trump? It loads most uh, highly on the Vikings fan subreddit, if I'm remembering correctly. So like, oh, Minnesotans for Trump minus Trump are Minnesotans? OK, that's not surprising. Um, so there's also some interesting stuff that's done here. Although, again, there are caveats in the interpretability because it's very easy to tweak it in certain ways until you get a story you want, completely on accident. Um, I've mentioned topic modeling before a couple times. Topic modeling is similar to LSA and grew out of a variant of LSA. But the basic premise here is still related words appear together. So if you have an article that mentions four or five words and another article also has three of those words and another one has four of them again, eventually you're going to come up with some notion of these words are related, they're in a group together. We'll call that group a topic. Once we have that topic, then we can say, or once we have a number of topics, we can then say, if we know that these words appear often in these topics, can't we figure out how much each document is about a topic? And then it'll go and predict, well, these documents are more about it because there's more stuff from that topic in it. And it goes back and forth iterating over, or iterating through your data, adding new words to topics, and then reassigning how much a document is about a topic, until eventually it has a stable-ish answer. So the same thing that we had with iterations earlier, where it would go until convergence or a maximum number of rounds. Does that sound familiar? Silence means yes, I guess. Um, so it'll go until either convergence or a fixed number of iterations. And it will then say, OK, here are our topics. 
and it'll give you the probability the word is in any given topic. It will also give you the probability that, or the distribution of how much about each topic each document is. So you get two useful pieces of information. You have clusters of words or concepts or ideas in the form of your topics, and you have levels of how prevalent that topic is in every document. Now you can start doing things like saying which documents are similar because they're talking about the same topic. Or here are words that only really show up in a few topics. And you can run analysis from that. One other important concept that I want to bring up within text analytics is the concept of a corpus. You guys know what training data is. A corpus is just the training data for text analytics, for a lot of these text analytic algorithms. It is the articles that go in, or the sentences, or your tagged information. If you have some sentences that have correct part of speech tags and some that don't, those are in your corpus. Um, this sort of thing is just what the training data is called. And your selection of corpus matters a lot, just like your selection of training data matters a lot. Uh, within my research, I use LSA a lot. And one of the things that made LSA very popular early on was that it can use different corpora to produce different similarities, allowing me to tell things about context. So what that means is if I am trying to predict whether two, or two concepts are the same thing, I can build it on a corpus of newspaper articles to get what a layperson would think about it, a well-informed layperson would think about it. Instead, I could select a corpus of journal articles from business journals. And that tells me what academics in business would think how well these two concepts are related. I could also train it on customer reviews, uh, which is what one of my colleagues is doing right now. Um, so we can run all these different kinds of data so that we don't just have, here's how similar these two documents are. It's how similar are they within this context. And that can produce very different results. So corpus selection is very important, just like training data is very important. Um, and that's kind of what makes a lot of what I do cool. So. We've talked about the tools. Does anyone have questions about the tools? OK. So what can we do with text analytics? Now that we've got it, now that we've collected all of our, um, all of our data, we've run it through some algorithms, how can that be applied? What happens? What's going to be predicted out of it? What is our machine learning algorithm going to tell us? And how do we use that to deliver value? One of the textbook examples, and earliest examples, is fraud detection. Uh, yes, credit cards can absolutely check for data based on weird transaction history, but you can apply it to text as well. Did the person who, you found a document, did Ben Franklin actually write it? Someone signed a, uh, someone modified a contract. Is it the person who signed an initial claiming they did? You have someone posting all sorts of random ads for how to make $4,000 a month doing nothing at home in a comment section. Has this person's account been compromised? These are all types of fraud detection. It's just looking for differences in how something is written compared to how you have seen them right before. And it includes stuff like your adjective to noun ratio. What kind, when you use contractions, are you using active or passive voice more? What slang terms do you use and what region do those slang terms apply to? Um, these are all different clues that can tell you, is the person the same person across these two documents? Uh, it's also used in some interesting academic exercises like uh, the Shakespeare authorship debate. Um, there are some people who argue that Shakespeare either wasn't a person or 
didn't actually write the plays or was a pseudonym or all sorts of other things. Trying to look at two different plays that Shakespeare wrote, did the same person write this based on these kinds of criteria and others? That's another example of something at least akin to fraud detection. Another popular use of this is grading assignments. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you took the SAT? How many of you took an essay section on the SAT? My understanding is it's optional now. So for a few years in there, the SAT's essay section was not optional. During that window, some of the essays weren't actually graded by humans. They were graded by robots. Uh, the way SAT essay section grading works is you had uh, two people evaluate it. If they were within a certain range of each other, then it's assumed they agree, and you just give them that score. If they are beyond a certain threshold of disagreement, a third person looks at it and assigns a final score. It turns out that a lot of the time, one of those two people was a robot. And how did that work? Well, they used LSA. And then they said, let's build a machine learning algorithm on this where we're going to project some good answers, some fives, into a space. And then we're going to project some fours, some threes, some twos, and some ones. And then we're just going to use a standard regression algorithm. Is this essay closer to a five or a four? And that is how some of the people who graded SAT essays worked. Shortly after they published the paper describing all of this, they stopped doing that essay section, or stopped making it mandatory. Uh, it's also used a lot in plagiarism detection, so uh, turn it in. Um, not, it doesn't just look for exact matches of text. It looks for, hey, this is highly similar uh, because I know what synonyms are. Or look, they just swapped some things in a dependency parse tree. So things like Turnitin have gotten pretty good at detecting plagiarism that way. Um, or they've gotten very aggressive at detecting plagiarism that way, I should say. And there are two other relatively new concepts that are emerging fields in text analytics. The first is content generation, and the second will be conversational agents. But content generation is any time where instead of a human writing all of the text, a bot writes some of it. The simplest form is something like autocomplete on your phone. You type a few letters and it predicts what the rest of the word is. And then it'll predict the next word and you'll say, yeah, that's the one I wanted. Until you finally say, no, I want something else. That might seem silly and kind of weird or pointless, but with how much time, how many people spend texting and searching the internet and posting things on the internet, it saves hundreds of billions of person hours every year to have these smart keyboards and this autocomplete. That's a lot of value for a relatively simple tool. But that's only the starting point for content generation. If you go and look at the AP, or Washington Post, or New York Times, you will occasionally find articles that are written by bots now. Usually it's formulaic stuff. So pretty much all local sports across the country is now just syndicated out to a uh, box score processing bot. So you have someone at the game that records all of the plays and that sort of stuff. And then an algorithm goes and writes the article from it. Um, it's cheaper than actually hiring people who know how to write. <coughs> a lot of financial reporting works the same way. We'll say, here is daily trading data. Let's make some insights and commentary. We know something about how industries are clustered because it's in a database somewhere. We know something about what companies were mentioned in other parts of the news. We know something about how uh, P.E. ratio versus 90-day uh, expected yield is. 
It has a little bit of information about all of those, and then it identifies things that it thinks are most unusual or most noteworthy, and just automatically writes an article about it. They're very formulaic. They definitely look bot written, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you want consistent reporting, a bot that's following a formula is going to be consistent. That's pretty much the thing it's best at. So it's going to go and write these similar articles. It will give you the information you need without having to have someone manually write the article and hire staff to do it. A final type of content generation is AI-assisted writing. Uh, the way this works is you have a bot that will generate parts of your document. It'll give you outlines or flow. It'll give you suggested words. Uh, it will give you the ability to poke and play around with it a little bit to tweak its outputs. Uh, there's a website made by The Onion called Clickhole. It's their parody version of BuzzFeed. One of the early, in the early days of Clickhole, uh, one of the, uh, it wasn't the editor-in-chief, but one of the co-editors saw a talk on this topic and was like, huh, that's interesting, let me try it. Didn't have a day of programming experience in his life. He just went and like mangled some stuff together. And he was able to cobble something together that would give him this assistive writing that took the form of it would give him the next 10 words that are just based on a prediction and he can press the right arrow to move over and then down to select a new one. So if he likes, oh, this sentence is sort of going in the right way. Oh, but I don't like where it turned here. Down, down, down. Cool. And then it generates new recommendations the rest of the sentence based on what you've selected. And it says, oh, these ones that you went past are good, so we're going to leave them alone. So some portion of the articles on Clickhole, I don't know the number, they don't release that anymore, but are written in this human-bot collaboration. Now, they do have the advantage of they are trying to sound absurd, because, you know, it's the Onion, it's a satire parody site, but that sort of AI adaptive authorship or authoring, or AI assistive authoring, is a very promising direction as kind of the next evolution of autocomplete. In that you can get a lot of your paper written that way. Now he admits he does have to go back and edit it later. There are still quirks it doesn't pick up on and weird parts of structure that it won't get right. But he's gone and turned the rough draft phase from taking a couple hours to taking five to ten minutes. That's pretty impressive. The last big new area in text analytics is conversational agents. So I mentioned these a little earlier. We've got OK Google, Alexa do this, Siri, all these other agents. You generally speaking have two options when giving them instructions. You can either tell them what you want them to do. Alexa, turn on the living room. Or you can say, Siri, how many states are in the United States? You're able to do either one because it has some text analytics under the hood that translate what are you trying to learn into hooks that will connect it to the appropriate resources. So they don't just have one enormous database of everything that you could possibly do. Instead, they have, I have some text. I'm going to run some uh, digitization to turn it into words. Then I am going to use those words in order to figure out what domain or topic or area it is. Now that I know that domain, topic, or area, I'm going to try and predict which of these tools can best serve that need. Then once I've identified the tool, I'm going to look at 
the rules inferencer within the tool that tells me how to translate a question of this type into something that this app will take in. The app then gives an answer and it's announced to the user. And all of this happens in seconds. And I think that's super cool. Um, there's also a lot of competitions that are trying to get even more elaborate. Um, I know that Quora, a question answering site, has recently worked on try, uh, one of their, they actually had a Kaggle competition on how can you predict what an answer will be to a question. And indirectly, they had uh, some middle steps, but that's what they were going for. So could Kaggle have a bot that answers questions automatically based on other answers given? So it knows what every other answer was to every other question on the site. Can it just synthesize that and make a new answer for people? Uh, we've also got uh, Amazon's, uh, or Amazon is currently running a competition for linguists where you can win a pretty substantial grant where their goal is to be uh, enable someone to have a five minute long conversation with your Amazon Echo about general topics. So can you have it tell me, talk about the weather and the latest movies and something in a way that a human would find engaging enough to talk to for five minutes? Now, who wants to guess why they care about this? Why would Amazon want you to talk to your Alexa device for five minutes? Five minutes about not super relevant content. So latest developments in the news, what movies showtimes are like, what's the weather. So it's not like they're asking, so did you hear about this great new belt? You should go buy it. It's just humdrum mundane. Why would Amazon be interested in this? That is one of the biggest reasons. Establishing trust with them so that people get familiar with it. Um, they're very interested in research on how children interact with uh, these smart home devices as well for a similar reason. Um, there's a significant study in industry. Well, if you grew up in a home with an Amazon Echo, then kids are used to being able to say, just shout to no one in particular, turn on a light or start the vacuum or unlock the door. How does that change things uh, in their development? So trust and shaping interactions with trust are definitely a big part of it. If they can get a generation of kids that are used to talking to at an echo the same way they would another person, that really goes a long way for their long-term strategy. So uh, Amazon actually has a security feature where you can't actually unlock a door with it. Okay. You can only lock a smart door with it. Okay. Which, I mean, it still has the same problem. Yeah. If like someone just like went out to throw out their garbage, I can just start shouting, Alexa, lock the door, Alexa, lock the door, until they, you know, get locked out. Okay. But yes, that is a concern. Okay. <laughs> um, so we, there might be some other ideas, some other reasons that these five minute conversation agent matters. Any other ideas? So we've got trust. Oh, no, that is not even a little bit Amazon's goal. Um, yeah, absolutely 0% do they have interest in getting you to have healthy conversations with other people. They are trying to get, they are trying to get children to treat their device the same way they would a human in terms of extending it trust. And uh, honestly, one of the more important things is getting used to the idea of making concessions to it. 
So if I ask you guys to turn in an assignment, but I only give you five minutes, you'll go back and say, hey, that's unreasonable. It's much easier for them to write bots and scripts that can say, I can't do that, and you being OK with that answer. Um, so they want to help normalize the idea that it's like another person. They have limited resources and abilities. Um, so we talked about sentiment analysis earlier. It can get all sorts of different uh, polar things. If you're talking for five minutes, you're providing it a bunch of training, or you're providing it a bunch of data. Maybe it can use your tone of voice. Maybe it can use your word choice. What can it figure out from that? Well, if you're feeling sad, maybe they will recommend a product that will help make you happy. If they figure out that you're hungry, maybe they'll start recommending food. If they figure out that you're conservative, maybe they are going to start recommending different books. That five minutes of conversation, especially if you're doing it frequently enough that they can detect changes, that gives them a lot of power in developing marketing strategies. So if you start your morning with Alexa saying, good morning, James, and today it's going to be sunny. So you don't need that umbrella. Thank you, Alexa. Start the toaster. You didn't put toast in it last night. Oh, I'm sorry. If I just spend five minutes like that, half awake, it can get a good baseline on me, and it can identify deviations and trends. Because when I am changing is when I am most susceptible to manipulation, because I've already overcome that inertia of being in one state. So that's another reason they want it. The last big reason they're looking at is baby boomers are getting older. As people get older, they tend to interact less with other humans. Um, well, they tend to interact less with others in general, I suppose. However, there is a strong value of independence and autonomy in the United States. There is also a mindset among older generations that tends to be a, maybe recalcitrant is the right word? regarding certain new technological developments as being frivolous and a waste of time. If they can provide something that someone is I, an older adult has identified that they are missing in their lives, or feels that they're missing even if they don't know it, if they can provide a substitution, it is a way to try and ingratiate themselves and hook themselves into a market share that is large, important, and they otherwise would not have access to. So five minutes of shooting the breeze replaces talking to your neighbor because you don't go out and mow the lawn anymore, so you don't see them. So that's also what's driving self-driving cars, or the main motivation behind self-driving cars. Uh, baby boomers getting older but not wanting to give up independence. And technology is finding a way to say, look, I know you don't like us, but I promise we're good for you. We can give you something that everyone else in the world is trying to take away from you. Just for a little scratch. So that's what I've got on text analytics. Well, so now that I've got that done, we've got about 10 minutes left. <laughs>